welcome to the I Cheat Myself Podcast. My name is Matthew Miniman, and this is episode five, a conversation about Fidelity National Financial, Mr. Cooper, and the Black Cat Hacking Group. With me today, I have Brandon Armstrong. He's been a guest on here before. Brandon, anything you want to say? Hello, it is good to be back. Excellent. So um, to start off with for today, we're going to start off with Fidelity National Financial. Fidelity National Financial, for those of you who don't know, is a mortgage lending group. They do mortgage services. They service loans, both with payment and selling and buying loans. They're basically just an all-in-one house. They also do titling. Uh, And they got hit by a a pretty significant hack. Their entire infrastructure was ransomware. They manage about $9 billion in mortgages across the United States. It's a lot of mortgages. It's a lot of mortgages. That is, that's all, that's, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what that, what's that to compare to everything else? I don't know. Uh, Does it matter when it's $9 billion? I guess not. Billion is the key word there, I guess. Yeah. Anyways, they got hit pretty hard by a hack. They had to report this to the SEC, and it's a pretty significant hack because what it has done is it has stopped all, stopped several uh, real estate deals in Illinois and Florida and Las Vegas and a lot of different places. It's just stopped the the, the mortgage process, and mm-hmm. so a lot of people have not been able to buy houses, and and they they just. They, they sort of, I don't know, to me, it just sounds, sounds pretty bad, but Brandon, this is kind of in your wheelhouse, right? Yeah. So just, just to let people know, I'm actually a real estate agent here in the Colorado Springs area. I have a team called the front range team with several realtors on it. So we, we deal with title companies quite a bit, as you can imagine. Do you deal with these guys ever like Fidelity Financial? Absolutely. Luckily, not during this hack, though. Oh, good. <laughs> well, so so I do have to preface before we go on any further. This is Fidelity National Financial. This is not Fidelity. Fidelity being the the financial um, uh, the umbrella company. Yeah, the umbrella. I, well, you know, the the banking and investment and public equity company that is that is Fidelity. This is a different Fidelity. Fidelity National Financial is based out of. Florida. And so this is an entirely separate company. May not have anything to do with Fidelity. I, I'm hacking a fraud, so I don't actually know if they have anything to do with the real Fidelity. But anyways, there you moving go. on. Do you guys, do you know what this will do to the entire process? I mean, I know I said at the top that this would stop mortgages at some point. What else does this impact? Like, what else can this can this hurt? Oh, yeah. So from what I've what I've read on this, it could affect potentially people's wiring process, right? So when you're buying a house, much of the time you have to put a down payment down, you'll have closing costs at the end of the deal, and you have to wire that to the title company in order to validate the funds to the the seller. And so, so, so if you don't wire that money or if like, so I understand that when you're closing, you have a set date. So what right. happens if you don't close on that date to the title company? What do they do? Yeah, absolutely. Well, everybody gets their contracts out and we go ahead and extend it out. But that's new prorations. Everybody has to recrunch numbers. It's quite a pain in the butt, actually. And then let's say if somebody needed to move out of their house and sell their their current one in order to buy the new one. It doesn't matter if they're dealing with Fidelity on buying their house. Now they can't buy it with that other title company because this title company is not releasing the funds to buy the new one. And so it basically just cascades, just a ton of it cascades, shit yeah, cascading down. So it's not just affecting this particular title company. It's going to be affecting everybody. Okay, so. This is actually coming on the heels of another hack that I that that I wanted to talk to you about as well. This one is called Mr. Cooper. Have you heard of Mr. Cooper before? You know who Mr. Cooper is? No. So for those of you who don't know, Mr. Cooper is a, another mortgage servicing lender, title company, all of that. They they do a lot of different different services for for 
for mortgages as well. They, they're, they're a primary holder of mortgages. In fact, when your bank gives you the initial mortgage, Mr. Cooper's typically who buys out that Oh, mortgage. They're, they're a secondary mortgage company. They hold three, $937 billion mm, in yeah. mortgage loans. They were hit the, the exact same way. They were compromised and they could not take payments. I think they just got their systems up this last week. Oof. And they got hacked in ha- Halloween. Like Halloween night is when they went down. Oh, my my uh, nephew's fiance actually was was bitching about this, telling me that he couldn't do any work. Like he hasn't been able to work. He's been getting paid, but he can't do any work because their systems have been just down. Oof. And if you go to Mr. Cooper's website, and it's actually you know just go to their website slash incident, uh, they it says on there that if you have been affected by this, you will face no penalties or additional late charges, late fees for for not for being late on your mortgage oh i'm not worried about people who owe their mortgages i'm worried about mr cooper being (laughs) punished (laughs) well so amazing yeah and what's what's really kind of interesting about this mr cooper specifically is that because they didn't actually report anything out um, and it was kind of learned secondhand there are a bunch of people who are suing mr cooper now they're just they're just going after them. The lawsuit is actually there's there's a class action lawsuit based out of northern northern Texas. So one plaintiff is seeking upwards of a five million dollar payout. So this is five million dollars because of a missed payment. I don't know. They could be a they could be a they could be a landlord and they have like sixteen houses. I don't know. Oh yeah, good point. Okay, yeah. so. It's interesting to see this from our from my perspective because the Fidelity National Financial hack was claimed by a group called Alpha uh, Alpha V or Black Cat uh, Alpha V rather or Black Cat, which is interesting because these these groups haven't really targeted the financial district like this before. They really haven't done that before, so it's a little interesting that they went this direction. But what's what's kind of also interesting to me is the timing of this hack. So uh, I know I mentioned before, and I've mentioned several times on my podcast about LastPass. LastPass got hacked and it's been a whole thing where we're kind of anticipating people who haven't been doing their due diligence on the LastPass hack are just, they're just, their passwords are known and they're out there. So the, these guys, the guys who, who did the LastPass hack are just gonna strike. We just don't know when and where. Well, three weeks ago, they did. They struck and they stole $9 million in crypto in a very coordinated effort. Like, And within like a two-hour period, $9 million in crypto was just taken out of wallets because, and we were able to link this through the, through the evidence that was apparent, we were able to link all of that loss to LastPass, to the LastPass breach because I'm... I'm an idiot, and I did this as well. I put my secrets, all of my secrets for my crypto, in my last pass. Oh, no. So that's what they went after. That's what these guys went after. They went after all of this to, to try to grab all that crypto. And so in the realm of, of timing, the way this looks, you know, three weeks ago, these guys strike and they go after their crypto. Well, in the cybersecurity world, in the industry, we kind of view that and we go, okay, that was their primary action. Like that's what they wanted to do. That was their target. They just wanted to grab the easy money in crypto. So then what they do with the secondary target is they actually sell the databases. Now they sell that those passwords out and they sell oh, yeah. them as targeted information to hacking groups. I'm sure groups. for pennies on the dollar. Oh no, 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 no. We're, we're talking... For the right credentials, we're talking hundreds to thousands of dollars per password. Wow. So really depends on what's contained in there. Because you, as you can see, you know, if you if you have the information in front of you, you know, username and password, most usernames and passwords, most usernames are a name and then at a domain. And typically that domain for a company account is the company name. And so if you can identify company accounts, you can be like, okay, yeah, I know this guy works at a bank. I know this guy works at Fidelity National Financial. Oh yeah. And so what may have happened here, and I'm only speculating because I don't actually know, but what may have happened here is that 
Black Cat purchased these credentials from those LastPass hackers because they specifically wanted to target this group. And they knew they could get and leverage these credentials to get in even further. And so we're seeing through this through through this whole thing. And this is this is kind of where I'm scared about this and why I've been trying to push for people to, to pay attention to this last pass thing is that they need to change their passwords. Like if you got if you were yeah. if you were in the last pass breach, you need to change your passwords. I all did, of them. I pull them all out. Every single password that was on there, right? Yeah. Do you did you use LastPass when it got hacked? No, I am unfortunately one of those Apple fanboys that has all of their stuff on another server. He's got a he's got a keychain. Everybody, everybody, everybody laughed, freak. Everybody laughed, freak. Well, you know, it hasn't been hacked though, so. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, no on that note, there was a hack for for uh, iPhones. Actually, any iOS device, any Mac, actually running web code which is the back end of the Safari browser, which mm -hmm. your phone has because it comes up by default. There was a there was a hack that involved that web code. So it, all anybody had to do was send a message, specially crafted message, or have a specially crafted web page that you visited. And that web code hack or, or exploit would actually pull your keychain data out. And it had full visibility into your keychain. Oh, fun. Well, I am super proud of myself. And I'm not trying to put out a challenge to see if you can trip me up. However, I, I quite often get these phishing emails. And what I do is if, if I think it's legit, I just go straight to the website instead of clicking a link on the email. Or if they're That's wanting information, yeah, I will call the company to make sure that they are actually asking for that information. This is the way. I thought he was going to start sucking on the teat of Apple again, but no. <laughs> he now that's the way. You get an email from from anybody and it includes a link. If you didn't expect that link, go to the webpage yourself and log in through that method because if you click the link, that drops a possibility that you could be fished. And authentication in the middle attacks, uh, cookie swap, all of those are possibilities after getting fished. So just don't click on the links. That's that's the message there. Anyways, moving moving on, moving 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 through this, the the other thing to to sort of keep in mind with this attack is that they have all this information now. They have all customer information from Mr. Cooper and Fidelity National Financial. They have all of this data for for all of these mortgage users. I don't know what data is in there. Obviously, it's going to be payment, address, first name, last name. Doesn't include social? Oh, yeah. I'm sure it does. Do you social, think... wiring information, probably bank information as to how much somebody has like in their ACH account. information? Yeah, probably. I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, these are all things that title companies ask for regularly in order to go ahead and close on your loan, right? For for those of you who don't know, ACH data is the information, it's the back-end information that banks will use to transfer money in and out of your account. So when you sign up and use, like, if they ask for a direct deposit mm -hmm. note, they're setting up ACH in the back end and they're trying, they're just creating a direct link from their account to your account. So like I have one for my, for my, gosh, for my investment accounts. Brain fart. Yeah, brain <laughs> fart. For my brain farts. No, I have an ACH for my, for my uh, investment accounts. I have an ACH for my, for my mortgage payment. It just directly yep. pulls it out of my account. Actually, my bank pushes it directly to my mortgage. That's that's how ACH works. I mean, consider this, right? So most people, when they're buying a home, they're buying in their own hometown somewhere. So what they do is they usually have two options to hand in what's called earnest money, which is essentially your skin in the game when you first go under contract with a house. The seller needs to know that you're going to abide by the contract rules. So they essentially Take hold... pound is flesh. Yeah, they essentially hold some of your money hostage until the end of the deal. And then you get it back if you hold your end. Well, this earnest money is usually paid by either wire transfer, right? And that's set up through the title company. That's a little bit more secure. But if you're a local, 
you're not going to do a wire transfer and pay the $30. What you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and fill out a check and you're going to hand it to that title company. And then the title company is going to scan that check and keep it in their database yep. as proof of earnest money. And then they're also going to send it to everybody as part of proof of this. So both realtors, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure in the, if, if their database was hacked like that, that would also be included. Yeah. All these scanned copies of everybody's checks. Well, and, and here's the here's the rough part about the ACH information and the checks and all of that is that if your credit card gets stolen, you can just tell your you can just tell the provider of their credit card or the debit card. You can say, Hey, I lost it, I lost mm -hmm. control of it. And they'll issue a new number and you'll get a new number with a new CNN number or whatever it is, the the three digit number on the back of the card. Sure and you'll get a new expiration date. And that's cool because all that data is new. But with your bank account, you can't just get a new number because they have to close the account. And if your credit is attached to that bank account, when you have to open up a new one, your credit will fall. And if you're buying a house at the same time, that could severely impact the sale, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, checks, what do they have? They have routing, well, you can find routing numbers for any bank that you want, it's public information. But uh, also has your account number yeah. on there. So. so yeah, your account number is directly displayed on there. And so you can't just change that data. The bank can't just change your bank account number and keep your account the same. They have to literally close the account number. And so doing that can have severe impacts. And on top of that, if you have an ACH transfer, you might not, one, you might not see it until it's too late. And two, your bank may not cover it. I know, you, I know all banks are FDIC insured, but that may not be covered. Because oh, it's yeah. because of, because of the way that it's transferred out, banks deal with this all the time, and I don't know, I, it's 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 one of those circumstances where you have you have to see both sides of the fence. The consumer doesn't want to be out the money, but the bank can't also just give away money if they've tra if somebody got all the information. Oh sure, look at what what happened with the silicon 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 bank. Mm -hmm. Uh, they they had a bunch of people I think taking out all their money at the same time and they they went down for it right they couldn't pay everybody yeah absolutely well wow, that's pretty terrifying <laughs> yeah it's it's a lot of it's a lot of crazy crap that that happened and and again this happened over the last Mr Cooper happened in uh, Halloween it happened Halloween night and this Fidelity Financial happened a week ago the twenty third of of October so it's been it's been a pretty big whirlwind of a week. Actually, I think it happened on the 20th. I, I don't know. It could be. Anyways, it happened a couple of weeks ago. Not a month ago. Not a month ago. <laughs> month ago. Yeah. So moving on, I wanted to focus on another another black cat group. So Alf V or black cat, as they're known, is, is this pretty prolific hacking group. Like they do a lot. They hack a lot of folks. And they hit this healthcare giant, Henry Shine. Henry Schein, if you don't know who Henry Schein is, for those of you who are who listen to the show, you probably don't because I haven't complained about them yet. And I just want to post this. I just want to say this again. There's no, no real reason why I need to say it, right? There's no reason why I need to say it. But all, all opinions stated on this show are a are intended for satire purposes only. <laughs> I, think we, I think we got the legality out of the way. Anyways. Henry Schein got hit with ransomware. For those of you who don't know Henry, who Henry Schein is, Henry Schein is a EMR uh, electronic medical records provider. They provide a software that medical organizations use for tracking patients and scheduling and things like that. Henry Schein has two sides to their business. They have a self-hosted side where you buy a server, you buy the software, and then you house it in your own data center or your own building. And then they have a cloud side, which houses all the information in their cloud and their data center. And you just go to their website and access your EMR from there. Mm. Uh, specifically, Henry Shine is the provider of a very popular dentist software called Dentrix. And Dentrix is, it's very popular. Several of my clients have used it. I have a couple who still use it to their, to their horror. They have discovered that it's not great. Uh, and Henry Schein 
sells a specific type of product to those businesses who want to house their own servers. They actually sell them servers in a box. They sell you an entire domain in a box. So it, it includes an Active Directory server that houses all of your usernames and passwords for computers. It houses the EMR software and everything's pre-configured to work together. And it has a file server on there too. So everything works together. And so they sell this out and one of the bad things, at least classically, that Henry Shine has been guilty of is that they send those servers out with the same password, the mm -hmm. same administrator password. They're all the same. In it's, fact, it's password, isn't it? I'm, I'm going to say with it. a capital P and an exclamation. Point. If only it were that difficult to guess. Oof. So I'm not going to tell what the password is. You can go find it yourself if you really want to go search for it. I'm sure the internet, it's on there somewhere. But <clears throat> if it's not, I could probably buy it from. From Black Cat, right? Yeah, you probably buy it from Black Cat. They probably would sell it to you pretty cheap. Anyways, they they ship all this stuff out. So so from from a security perspective, Black Cat Henry Shine is not really doing a great job in cybersecurity. He's sending out passwords that have the exact same all servers that have the exact same password, not great security. So I automatically have a distrust of Henry Shine as it is. So Moving moving past that, what happened was that uh, Henry Schein got hacked initially by Black Cat and had uh, had their data encrypted. It was a ransomware attack, and and they they held Henry Schein ransom. And so Henry Schein went through and did a, an investigation and a research and attempted to clear out the Black Cat software, and they claimed victory. They said, oh yeah, we, we've cleared it out. We're the, it was just a cybersecurity incident. Uh, we've done our job. And then they got hacked again, and Black Cat <laughs> really owned them this time. They stole 35 terabytes worth of data. Oof. So just so you're aware, 35 terabytes of data is, is a lot. Like, it's not a little bit. Like, that's a lot. Oh, that, yeah. That probably includes patient data. It probably includes all of the source code for their software it probably includes all all customer information all support information all ticket mm -hmm. information so all that got got yikes yeah and this is this is a big deal because what this is highlighting what this is demonstrating is that you have a vendor henry shine who has shown a either an unwillingness to pursue cybersecurity or incapability they are incapable of doing it like I said, I'm not, I don't under, I don't know the full details of this hack and I'm not going to claim to know it. It could be much more complicated than what we're seeing from the outside. And Henry Schein could be doing everything they possibly can and more. And they just got owned badly by, by Black Cat. But if you get owned twice, that tells me that you probably didn't plan very well. Right. Um, and, and the fact that I, my customers who have, Henry Shine software didn't know about this until I told them three weeks after it happened. That's also a bad sign as well. Yeah. It means they're not reporting it like they should. And so that, that happens quite a bit with companies, right? Where this happens. Really depends on the industry. If there is no reporting requirement, then yeah, you may never know. You may never know if a company gets hacked. Got it. Uh, until it's too late. Like with, oh, we, we've run into this so many times. LastPass happened once, so they didn't let anybody know for six months that they got hacked. But Henry Shine is a hip type of organization. They're required to report uh, within 30 days. Like within 30 days, they're supposed to have a report ready for the OCR to go through and discuss. Mm. Like that's the thing. And that didn't happen because it wasn't, would have been big news. It would have been huge news that this EMR got hit. So uh, a lot of this, another thing that this highlights is when you get hit by ransomware, before you get hit, you need to have a plan. You need to have an incident response plan already in place. You need to have a disaster recovery plan in place. You need to understand how you're going to recover from a full down scenario to a business operational scenario. You need to understand that as an organization. You need to know what the timeline looks like. You need to have plans in place for that to occur. A cyber security fire drill. Yeah, that's it. Tabletops are, are a perfect example of how you help prepare for that. That's where you can spot where you're deficient in some areas. Because in openly, had Henry Schein done a full tabletop, 
they would have had data on their how unprepared they are. Now, what's a tabletop? So a tabletop is basically a D and D match for your a Dungeons and Dragons version of a cybersecurity incident. I go oh. through as a dungeon master and tell you how a hacker gets in and. I expect you to roll for initiative and tell me if you've successfully defended them or not. When I say roll for initiative, I mean discuss amongst yourselves about how well you're going to protect yourself. Sure. But in the end, a tabletop is always going to assume that you failed and how do you respond when you failed? And so it's, it's engineered so that you go through a worst case scenario every time so that you know what points you're deficient at for detection and prevention of an attack. So for instance, one of my organizations, they use a specific remoting software called Citrix. It's very popular. Part of Citrix? Yeah, so Citrix is extremely popular. And in fact, there's a couple of hospitals that got hit that likely got attacked because of Citrix. Now Citrix needs regular updates. Like there is very, they have very, at a very regular pace, are detected to have critical exploits, critical vulnerabilities that can be exploited to gain access into the Citrix environment. Those, that's bad. That's, that's real bad. Right. Right. So as a tabletop exercise, I might ask you, uh, I might say an attacker is attempting to, to breach your Citrix environment. They've gotten in. How did they get in? And you as an organization, you as the, as the leaders of your organization are going to be like, well, they might have done this and they might have done that and they might have done that. And I'm going to listen to the way that you were replying to me, basically going to be like, okay, they've done this. So what could you do to prevent that? Like, how can you detect that? And a lot of it centers around just being aware, like watching, watching the wall mm. and understanding where, where your information, where your attacks are coming from. And that like I said, it will show your deficiencies because you'll be like, oh, we totally don't have visibility here. We don't, we're not watching this gate. Right. And that's kind of what tells me Henry Schein didn't do. They didn't have this deficiency. They didn't have a tabletop to tell them they were deficient. They didn't have a review. They didn't have a, a mature cybersecurity platform to educate themselves on how they can do better. I've heard that some companies actually hire kind of consultants who go in and they quote unquote secretly try to hack into somebody's system. And then after they've successfully hacked into it, they go ahead and tell the people in charge that actually hired them, okay, these people didn't catch this. Uh, this is how you need to go ahead and protect yourself against this. There you go. Yeah, that's, that's called a penetration test. A penetration test. Yeah, okay. penetration test penetration test because we're going <laughs> to penetrate you. Um, I've done that and it's, it's fun. It's really like, honestly, penetration tests are some of the most entertaining things you can do as, as a cybersecurity practitioner, because you get, you get a piece of paper that you get out of jail free card and you can basically do anything you want and be confident that if you get caught, well, it's, it sucks because you didn't succeed in your objective, but well, it's also good because the company, at the very least, is paying attention. That's right. That's right. Penetration tests are amazing. I, I, I walk in for one client. I had we did a penetration test, and their their IT environment, their IT guys, they all wear. I don't know that you would say they dress up, but they definitely wear button down shirts and they wear slacks. Not khakis. But a slacks. uniform. Well, it's not really uniform, but it's 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 dress clothes, right? And so that is that is the that is the what they're supposed to have, and they're all supposed to have a badge. And so I walk into this one company, and I I have a hoodie on, I have a beanie on, and I don't have a badge. I have nothing on me that tells them that I'm a part of the organization. And I walk in, and I walk up to the front desk, and I say, "Hi." I'm Peter from IT. This is like my second day. And they told me that I needed to come here and work on a ticket for you. And they told me there was something up with a monitor or something. They were really unspecific. They just told me to come here. And I'm, I'm really sorry. But I, they kind of throw me to the wolves. Can you help me out? And I do not. The lady was like, oh, yeah, dear. Here, just, just come around the back. And I was like, okay, well, I, I don't have my keys yet. They didn't give me a fob. And she's like, oh, here, take mine. And she hands me her keys to slot Yeah, to walk around, to scan in and walk around. I could have I could have walked into the office, 
taken her keys and done who knows what. She wouldn't have known. But I go back to her computer and I'm like, okay, I don't know which computer it is. Can I, can I just take a look around? And she's like, yeah, go ahead, honey. It's okay. It's fine. It's fine. I'm like, well, can I start with your computer? And she was active on her computer. She had her her, her software up and, and everything. So I could see everything that was going on. I could see all the appointments over there. And so I walk up and I'm just start typing and she has no idea what I'm doing. She has no idea who I am because I, I just told her I'm Peter from IT. And that's it. Like I like I have her computer. I have every access that she has. And I'm looking around as I'm working on a computer, I'm lifting up her keyboard. I'm lifting her, looking around her mouse looking around her phone and everything, and I'm lifting every object I can on the desk because I'm really looking for. What I'm really trying to find is a sticky note with a password on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I bet. Because they, they're everywhere. They're everywhere, and people are just dumb. Anyways, it's well, really and, and if you wanted to be really malicious, I've heard people can plug in you know, a USB drive of some sort. Let me know if I'm full of BS, of course, but you can plug in a USB drive, and essentially you can go ahead You're and... Full of shit, no. You can but log... <laughs> You can log everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. You can you can set up a key logger. You can set up what's called a bad USB. You can set up a rubber ducky, which which just runs commands on a computer. As a penetration test, one of the things we'll do is we'll set up a bad USB. It's called a rubber ducky. And, and what it does is when you plug it in, it just runs some basic commands on there. And it shows us that USB ports are properly protected, mm. which means I can run just arbitrary commands by plugging in a USB device. And so we... That's that's one of the things we test specifically to identify that efficiency because it's a common attack vector, especially for for larger companies, larger organizations. They'll 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 need to get in through one of those methods, and you never want to just give somebody access to your computer. And moreover, you don't want to just on your login you lock your computer and say, "Okay, I need you to log in now." Don't you need to not touch my computer? This specific client that I was able to do this at was a healthcare organization as well, which means I was able to get into their EHR software, which means I would have had full access to patient data, which is bad because that then that would need to get reported if I had, if I were an attacker, that would need to get reported to the OCR, which is a huge deal. It's a big, bad problem. So yeah, anyways, that's, that's, that's the penetration test. And yes, they do that. And likely Henry Schein probably didn't have they either didn't have that done or they didn't have it done well because there are penetration testers who are just push button, make $10,000 guys. I had run into them before and they are, they're would call a script kitty if they were hackers, because all they do is they run a script on their computer that just does some pre-programmed stuff and they go and play Xbox for four hours while it does penetration tests, quote unquote. And, like that, that's another area where you, you probably need to have somebody, a third party come in and say, was this good enough? Was this something that we can, that we can do better at? And it can be expensive. Trust me. I understand it can be expensive, but Henry Schein is not a small company. I'm sure that, that a proper cybersecurity platform for them would have been a rounding error on their gross profit. Jeez. So there's this was possibly an inexcusable lapse of of uh, attention on their cybersecurity. On that note, the, we did see earlier this month the guy. So SolarWinds, you did I talk to you about? Solar, yeah, uh, have I you heard solar Winds? Solar Winds? No. Okay, so Solar Winds was a huge hack back in 2020. It was at the beginning of COVID. That's all I remember. <laughs> beginning of COVID because that was a shit year. Um, but uh, SolarWinds got hacked and it didn't just get hacked. They they got in and were able to replace the software updates. The, an attacker was able to put in their own software updates for a very particular piece of software that controls network, uh, network objects. So like switches and routers and firewalls, it's able to control all of that. And they were able to get into the software. So they were able to get into all of the networks that were associated with the software. And they hit things like the Department of Justice. They hit TD Ameritrade. They hit some real big organizations mm. with this. And there was a big investigation through this. The NSA, Mandiant, uh, the FBI, the CISA, all have been paying very close attention to this specific hack 
because of who it affected and how it affected them. Uh, anyways, last or early last month or earlier this month, we found out that the chief information security officer is being charged with a felony uh -oh. for this felony negligence because apparently what happened was is he they actually did do a lot of these security things like they went and got a deficiency they went and did a gap assessment they went and got a penetration test they went and reviewed a risk management platform and the they got shit scores on everything that they that they did and this dude chose to ignore it to keep his stock price up because what good is an organization an IAT organization if they can't protect their own shit if they're not if they're not willing to invest in their own security right yeah so this dude is getting charged with a felony and he's he's expected to to be in a court now since then they've they've gone through a sentencing platform and it sounds like the judge is going to be lenient and only and only send it sent to probation mm. but it's it's this is real like this is a thing if you do if you if you don't do the due diligence as a security practitioner you can be in hot shit there's due diligence and there's due care and i've had people ask me what the difference is between due diligence and due care and due diligence is i see uh, i see a homeless guy in my store he i just need to make sure he's not still stealing anything that's due diligence do care is walking him out of the store. Got it. That is that is the difference. You see something and you do something about it. Whereas due diligence is you see something and you make sure it's not going to cause harm. Got it. So uh, do care as a security officer, do care is making sure you're taking the steps of protecting the environment. When you know there's a deficiency, document it, make evidence of it, and you report it. And you make sure that you make it not a problem. Well, yeah, and, or you make it somebody else's problem. You try not to. You try not to just ignore it or sweep it under the rug. Or eh, it'll hurt our stock price. So I can't really admit to that. Mm. So we're seeing that. I won't be surprised if something similar happens. If we see similar things happen with Henry Shine. Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah, that's 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 a lot of shit. Yeah. Anyways, it's like drilling teeth. Yeah, it's wow. like wah, wah, hilarious. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that when you were talking about the dental records. You know, if I, I use a dental company that uses this, I mean, people are going to know how terrible my teeth are. You know, yeah. you don't want that. I don't want to get sued, but there are large organizations that use this. Oh, yeah. Franchised organizations that use this. There's a big franchised organization that uses this that has thousands of sites across the united states that uses this software oof yeah so it's not a small hack at all it affects quite a few people mm -hmm. and it's just like the the fidelity national financial thing it's the effect it's going to affect a ton of people and the mr cooper mr cooper almost a trillion dollars in in more mortgages that's it's a lot of houses dude some scary stuff yeah it makes me want to go out and get some sort of credit protection or some sort of bank protection okay if I all right we're now, now you've lit fire into my ass okay <laughs> so do not invest in any of those stupid platforms because they don't do anything oh well don't they lock people out from taking money out and like for running your credit you can do that yourself you can do what is called you can lock your credit all you have to do is call the the credit the the, the credit organizations equinox and I don't know, TransUnion. All you have to do is call them and be like, I'm locking my credit. And then you lock it. And then only you can unlock it because they they set it up with a security scheme. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Don't go with any of these other, uh, with any of these other identity protection because, and I'm, and don't want to tell, I don't want to say this because I, I don't want people to feel like it's not worthwhile, but it's not really doing anything for you when you, when you get that stuff. And you see organizations offer it as sort of a, a an apology for losing your data. It's total and complete horseshit. That is not protection. It doesn't do anything for you. All it does is create another layer for you to ignore and another obstacle for yourself. It doesn't actually prevent an attack. The guy, I don't know 
I don't remember which company it was, but there was an organization that had a bunch of commercials and this guy was like, I'm so confident in our services. Here's my social security number. And he posted it. Oh, I remember that. And he had TV commercials with his social security number on it. I think he had it on a truck that was driving around a big town or what have you. Yeah. 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 And you know what happened? He had He got hacked? (laughs) Yeah. He had his identity stolen so many times that I don't remember exactly what happened, but it basically made it impossible for him to function. That is how many times his identity got stolen. Oof. The, The products do not work. They are placebo they are there to make you feel better there are certain things that they can do for you like there are certain ones that will add insurance to you like they'll insure you and so if you get hacked they will add another they'll give you 10 grand or whatever to repair your credit whatever it is that they you might need sure but it is it is not an active service that that i would recommend good and, to know and if you see a company offering it to you it's the same thing as bp saying sorry you're <laughs> sorry yeah <I'm> sorry <laughs> good to know yeah good to is. know well you got anything else you got anything you want to talk about anything you want to cover no no i I'm going to go ahead and talk to some people that were using Fidelity to close a deal lately just to see what kind of stressful situations that's put them and their their clients in. I am curious. I'm sure there's a ton of that out there. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, so for you guys, I hope you all have had a great time listening to us blabber on and me rant about random shit. But for this Uh, For this episode, my sources were Cybersecurity Dive, the TechCrunch, and Leaping Computer. And uh, I'll have all of those in the show notes. And uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful day.